There was a time in my life when I did not watch anime. I was young, innocent. I had never been to Belgium. People around me would talk about the great works of the movement, about Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, Neon Genesis Evangelion, Kiss X Hunter, and I wanted to experience those for myself. So I went to Belgium. I watched anime. Some of it was good. When I left Belgium and returned to the worst good place, I brought anime with me. I wasn't only watching it, I was talking about it on the internet as my full-time job. I was obligated not only to delve into the classics that I'd seen held in such high regard, but to seek out new and different animations that were, as the kids say, strange. I watched the one where the girl becomes the internet. I watched the one where the skeleton runs a bookstore. I watched the one where the talking giraffe makes theater kids stage fight in a high school time loop. Still, I was not sufficiently educated. Like good Professor Dyer in Lovecraft's At the Mountains of madness. I dug deeper and sought out new and horrible truths purely for the sake of my own abject fascination. I watched the one where the man can't decide which eight-year-old to have sex with so he just chooses all of them. I watched the one that shot in first person where you, the viewer, get down on all fours and beg different women to see their panties and parts of it were legit kind of funny. I watched Conception. These did not break me. I understood them. I knew that they were speaking to the basest parts of humanity in their audience. Today, I share with you the show that broke me. Jingai San no Yome is based on an ongoing four-panel manga series, which means that despite my having seen all of it, there is still more of it. There is no official English translation, but this website translates the title as The Evildoer's Wife, though Wikipedia seems to prefer Non-Human Creature's Wife. My anime list classifies it as a romance show, a comedy, and a fantasy. It is a horror, wrapped in a cute exterior that reveals more darkness the longer it watches you. Let us begin. Episode 1! Jingai San no Yome. This is 16-year-old Tomori Hinawa. In two and a half minutes, he will be married to a Moomin. We start with a montage of the boy leaving his bed and preparing for school, where nothing out of the ordinary will happen. His hair lets the viewer know that he has a bright future ahead of him as a Yu-Gi-Oh sidekick. While trying to engage in learning, he is summoned to the faculty room by this woman, the one who sells the children. Recently, a thing visited her office, flipping through middle school yearbooks in hopes of finding a wife. Yes, a wife. Marriage. True love. After thoroughly perusing the catalog of child brides, poor Tamori Hinoa was chosen. We see his face, growing ever closer as the camera zooms in, his cold eyes staring unendingly at the future. Episode 2! We got married! This is a Moomin. Their name is Kananogi, and they take children for to marry them. Everyone is okay with this. They look like a banana with turkey drumstick arms and wear a scarf on their head like a polar bear babushka. Bear bushka. They're fast. They eat concrete. They know how to share. Wretched Kananogi and poor Tamori leave the town hall with their marriage certificate and they begin the ritual head sucking, the slimes of love. While having his head gummed, poor Tamori asks himself, how did this even happen? Would that I knew, child. Would that I knew. They are given a house. The Moomin stands in the door like a bear on two legs, ready to bring their full weight down on their unsuspecting wife. Oh no, the thing is fluffy. Very fluffy. Poor Tamori begins to have lewd thoughts about the Moomin and bashes his head against the wall as penance, just like Mother would want. Episode 3! Classmate and Wife The wretched Kananogi sleeps like this. They follow their new child bride to school, only to be stopped at the entrance. Though seemingly unable to enter the halls of learning, the wretched Kananogi does have some means of pressing their nose against the third floor window to watch their poor love. This is horrifying to everyone. Everyone except for poor Sora Hikurakawa. They're still in that phase where they want to admire their wives, he says as the wretched Kananogi pushes their face against the glass barrier that 
that separates them from the children. Poor Sora jokes that he is also a member of the Wives Club, hiding his pain behind a bright smile. Poor Sora is married. He is married to this. A balding Pokemon. Their name is Fuhai, and they bathe together every day, with poor Sora massaging new hair growth formulae into Fuwai's decrepit scalp night after night. Poor Tomori Hinoa is jealous of this. Episode 4! Transfer Student and Wife. In this episode, we learn that the wretched Kananogi has teeth. Daily, poor Tomori will make dinner for the concrete eating freak to whom he is married. The wretched Kananogi does not eat the dinner, he eats concrete. But as a show of appreciation, he will inundate his spouse's head with the slimes of love, putting him into a state of pseudo-sexual bliss. Poor Sora thinks that this is weird. There is a new student at the school, a new disciple of learning. Their name is Tsukitsu... Tsukitsuka. They do not have a face. They do not have a anything. Nothing but their young wife. Poor Ichiya Mokusaibashi. A boy described as gloomy, sinister, and unnecessarily tall. He is a gruff character and independent. But upon seeing Tsukitsuka for the first time and acknowledging their lack of physical form as the embodiment of perfection, poor Ichiya ejaculated on the spot and begged the ball of ribbons for marriage. Unsatisfied with his husband's blank non-stare and longing to know their true feelings, he creates a face for his love in permanent marker. They seem happy. Episode 5, Falling, Day by Day. Poor Tomori reveals to poor Sora that the wretched Kananogi has begun watching him poop and bathe. Poor Sora begins to sob with jealousy as Fuwai looks at him like, Dude, what the heck, bro? That's messed up, man. Like, whoa, like, that is not a healthy relationship dynamic, my dude, my man. Like, bro. We flash back, tumbling into the past to the moment when Fuwai chose poor Sora to be their wife. The child is overjoyed, saying, This is the first time someone's picked me! I overflow with questions. Instantly, Fuwai regrets the decision. They wanted a rad punk skater child with Tony Hawk tattoos and a half-baked attitude, and instead received a clingy, insecure twink of a boy with half of his first chest hair still stored in a box under his bed. Mistake. Cut to poor Tamori being watched in the bath. He considers with some embarrassment the idea of his husband seeing his naked body, then confirms the horrid truth that the wretched Kananogi is always technically naked. Moomenschlong. With his brief moment of puritanical hesitation temporarily abated, poor Tamori invites his husband to bathe. They're fast. They use their head covering to lather. Poor Tamori catches sight of the wretched Kananogi's tail in the bathwater, freely floating amidst the clean, back and forth as the hair of a mermaid in the ocean brine, and fleeing the lavatory, poor Tamori discovers that he is not in fact straight, but hair-sexual. Yes, hair-sexual. A disciple of Heros, a pun that works just as well in English as it does in Japanese, which is neat. Episode 6, Exchanging Rings. Husbands are hot. Wives are hot. Marriage is all the rage. People are doing it for fakesies now. So much so that it's becoming a problem. A government problem. Poor Tamori is asked by the woman who sells the children to find some way of proving that the marriage that she arranged between this child and this woman is a legitimate one. The wedding is on. A glorious day. There are photographers and Pokemon and Skitska seems happy, at least. Poor Tamori sits in his husband's arms, cheering to the assembled crowd that this is the best day of his life, before cans are tied to Kananogi's rump and they rocket away from the scene like Buzz Lightyear rocketing away from that scene. Fast. The other poor wives, caught up in the passionate flames of matrimony, also catch wedding fever, desiring the informal social recognition of what has heretofore been a largely legal union. Skitska is frightened. The wretched Kananogi and poor Tamori, separated from their friends, walk down the streets as husband and wife, happily eating tin cans and snuggling into that soft, soft, intoxicating fur. Episode 7, 
our first summer. <sighs> oh no, a beach episode. Sensei reminds the students that despite having the opportunity to have two and a half months of uninterrupted spousal bliss, they still have homework. Poor Sora, baller that he is, says, Nah, letting you know right now, Teach, I'm gonna be spending too much time with this thing's penis inside me to balance chemical equations. And he's right. Beach, fireworks, Skitska is happy. Stop. Viewer beware. You're in for a scare. Our poor group hears from poor Ichia that couples who walk through dark tunnels together become closer. They would like that. Our group wants to be close. Confrontation! Another man has bumped into the wretched Kanonogi and felt his soft, supple, and arousingly furry body. That can't stand. Two and a half months pass. Summer vacation is over. We return to North Jingu High School without a single panning shot of Kanonogi in a bikini. But Kanonogi Kini. Alert! There is a new man! He's handsome, smart, everything that poor Tamori could have been. Just as King Solo Man split the Gordian baby in twain, this man has two husbands. Their names are Roku and Nana, and they are both married to student council president Giga Chad Sukchiki Yosei Tetsushi. They like his glasses, regard his smile, his elegant rectangular frames, his tasteful neck ornament, and the depleted battery of his polo shirt. Poor Tamori doesn't stand a chance. He introduces himself to this god amongst men only for Roku and Nana, fierce and bloodthirsty defenders of their wife, to, to fucking destroy him with words. Poor Tamori is not super high spec. There is no need for other wives. Verily suffers our hero appointed linguistic death. Episode 8! Sports festival! Cheerleading! Healthy competition amongst the youth. We learn of the fierce rivalry between poor Ichiya and poor Gigachad Tsuchikiyose Tetsushi. They will run. It is unimaginably important that we learn which of them runs faster. But that isn't all. Ball tossing! Concrete eating! Cavalry but wait, what is that thing? There are girls at this school! Shut your mouths and affix your eyes to the screen! The relay race begins! Cheerleading! Leading. They're fast. Poor Ichiya and poor Giga Chad Tsuchikiyose Tetsushi repeat the same three frame run cycle like 20 times in their quest for athletic supremacy. Cheerleading! Skitska seems happy. Their love propels poor Ichiya forward. Run, poor Ichiya! Achieve the ribbon! With all the poise of a dancer and all the strength and speed of a dancer, poor Ichiya overtakes poor Giga Chad Tsuchikiyose Tetsushi and becomes the winner of the race! Celebra- Who are you? Celebrations abound! Our poor group cheerleads themselves home as champions! Episode 9, Flu and Wife. It's cold now. There's a flu. There's a wife. There's a moomin. Poor Tamori succumbs to that most human of urges. The urge to succumb to a viral infection. But he is grateful. Having a viral infection means that he cannot infect his beloved husband. What? That's not how that- Anyway. The wretched Kananogi carries their bride through the streets, ignoring the rightfully horrified onlookers. When next we see poor Tamori, he is surrounded by poor Ichiya and poor Giga Chad Sachikiyose Tetsushi. They're friends now, properly immunized friends. Ah, the good old days. The wretched Kananogi, fearing for the life of their poor enslaved spouse, seeks to end illness with a hunger strike. It, it works. Good for him. Good for him. Episode 10 Everyone's White Day. Everyone's white now. Skitska, Kananogi. Poor Tamori. Tamori engages in craftsmanship to create a present slash meal for his love. He laments that the present he created is not big enough to express the size of his affection for this, so he makes a bigger one. Quantifiable affection. A gift. The slimes of love. Poor Tamori puts it next to all the other enshrined meal leavings that the wretched Kanonogi has thoughtfully given him over the months of marriage. He giddily kicks. Fuwai wants to become a bag. They settle for using their blood-stained paws to create a heart for their beloved skater twink. 
Skitska seems happy. Happy enough to kill? We cut to poor Giga Chad Tsuchikiyose Tetsushi gently criticizing the appearance of his husbands who gaze at him in amazement as he consumes the extremely mediocre cookies that they stole from the cooking club. Wah, wah. Episode 11, First Anniversary. Imperceptibly slowly, yet astronomically fast, our beautiful Earth completes her orbit around the sun. The whole of a year has passed since the wretched Kananogi stole this child. None of the interesting parts of this episode have anything to do with that. Fuwai, with their crippling fear of loneliness, wraps themselves in a cocoon of poor Sora's belongings, sleeping on their video game console so as to be close to the thing about which their spouse cares the most. Poor Ichiya has a terrifying dream about his spouse disappearing or getting naked? One of those. <laughs> That one, reminiscing on these wonderful matro moments makes the boys cry, and poor Tamori leaps from the window, the third floor window, into the waiting mouth of Kwananogi Swan, though he does question if Moomins are even capable of understanding what an anniversary is. Episode 12, Feelings Forever Together. We made it, the end, the Sakura trees are blooming. It's a metaphor. It starts to rain. It's a metaphor. We cut to the title card of poor Tamori looking sad as the creature holds an umbrella above his head. It's a metaphor. A harsh storm threatens to metaphorically destroy the metaphorical cherry blossoms, so the wretched Kananogi slips out of his home to fastly run to where the cherry blossom is and hold their umbrella over it to keep it safe and dry. It's a metaphor. They stand, unflinching against the torrential rains, protecting innocent beauty against the harsh and apathetic ravages of nature, but soft. The rain stops, not because of this at all, but instead because Roku and Nana yelled at God. You go, creatures. Philip Pullman would be proud. The gang gathers for a cherry blossom viewing. Skitska seems happy. It's because they reproduced last night. Then, what's this? A party for poor Tamori's anniversary birthday. Since when it- Poor Tamori's birthday. Pop the poppers. Shake the maracas. No longer is poor Tamori a Moomin 16-year-old child bride. He is now a Moomin 17 year old child bride. I love a character arc. What are you? The wretched Kananogi takes one more chance to stare blankly at the viewer, then turns their attention to their wife. The child looks at the vaguely banana-shaped bear Babushka, his eyes meeting one of theirs, and the episode just kinda ends. Thus concludes the anime where the boy marries a Moomin. Never have I before or since felt quite- God damn it, there's a mo- The manga! I could find no official translation of the Jengai San no Yome manga, which means that Yu Ayakawa's dreaded work is currently contained accessible only to those who dare seek it out. Roughly eight chapters worth of content was adapted to screen out of 22. 22 that have been translated. There are like 40-something chapters of this story. And believe it or not, those 40-something chapters contain answers. Answers that lead only to further puzzlement. Mainly, we learn from these random shoppers in a throwaway line in chapter 16, verse 1, that these creatures take child brides are relatively new in town. They just showed up and started stealing children for holiest matrimony and it was fine. Poor Tamori creates a concrete effigy of himself for Kananogi to eat, then gets jealous when Kananogi wants to eat it instead of him. Skitska gets naked, a lot. She also starts keeping a kitten in her head and has an attendant demon. We meet this girl, yes, a girl, a bride, a female wife. Poor Yori, who is explicitly married against her will to this thing. This thing! Their name is Lachian Eckhart-san, and they are worshipped as a god. They can be this big, or this big. They eat misfortune. Nothing but useful. They save a child from a burning building, and the child reacts like this. Kananogi lives at the bleeding edge of fashion and cannot be denied, ever. Kananogi begins to assimilate poor Tamori. This 
this is getting out of hand. Now there are 40 of them. Hush. Did you hear that? Poor Tamori acquires a stalking man. A stalking man who- Wait. What? You're- your what? This is poor Mikoto Kananogi. He is the wretched Kananogi's ex-wife, which is a plot twist I was not expecting. Watch your back, poor Tamori. Hell hath no fury like a former male child bride scorned by a banana bear. Drama, rivalry, but that's not all. In a heel turn that would rival the most ambitious of telenovelas, poor Mikoto is not only not poor, he is not Kananogi's ex-wife. Somehow, this mouse-brained dunce boy misinterpreted the fact that his parents adopted the wretched Kananogi for tax purposes as an arranged marriage to a Moomin. <laughs> but that's not all, because this revelation does not change his behavior in the slightest. Underage incestuous Moomin infidelity. And that has to be the end of it. I have no idea what is contained within the 16 or so chapters that I don't have access to, but my job is done. Now you have seen what I have seen, and you have felt what I have felt. If, for whatever reason, you've decided that the story wherein a child is married to a Moomin is worth your time, you can find it on Crunchyroll. Thank you to all my patrons for your support. I probably would not have made this video without you. Especially today's lucky patron, Adam Saunders, who has been supporting the channel for six wonderful months. Thank you very much, Adam. And thank you very much to everyone else. All of my viewers, all of my patrons, everyone whose name you see here, and everyone whose name you don't. If you want to have a chance at becoming today's lucky patron, visit patreon.com slash explanation point to find out how. You can also join our Discord server and our weekly game get-togethers. All kinds of good stuff there. Next video, we're going back to hardcore analytic content in my usual style. Remember to subscribe and turn on notifications so you're alerted when that goes up, and until next time, this has been Explanation Point, signing out.